Well, I must admit, I wasn't uh, really crazy about the latest iteration of the um, Superman myth, the movie Man of Steel. I guess I'm just too old for these um, CGI movies. I, I find when the, the CGI special effects kick in and all this kind of whiz-bang activity goes on, I just sort of check out. And I think they were designed for people who came of age with, you know, MTV and video games and all that. Um, so I, I wasn't really crazy about it because it's about three quarters whiz-bang. However, there is a theme in it that I think is, is worthy of some uh, reflection. Namely, the tension between autonomy and state control. Now, the movie opens with a pretty lengthy section on um, Krypton, so Superman's home planet that is, you know, in its last stages. But what's going on, though, is a battle between um, General Zod, who's the advocate of a sort of a fierce totalitarianism, and then this um, figure, the father of Superman, Jor-El, who is a scientist. What becomes clear is that Jor-El was resisting this totalitarian uh, impulse of General Zod to control utterly the genetics of kryptonite newborns. I know I sound pretty nerdy right now, but what, what's laid out is a kind of platonic vision. You know, in Plato's Republic, uh, there are three strictly controlled classes of people. You know, the low-level kind of workers, and there's the soldiers, and there's the, the guardians. Something very similar now on, on uh, Krypton, where they control the genetics of the uh, newborn, so the society is strictly um, divided. Well, uh, Jor-El and his wife have decided to have a child in the natural way, which is against the law. And this is um, Superman. This is the little baby. And the idea is, as the planet dies, they're going to send him off into outer space as a kind of avatar of freedom and, and personal autonomy over and against General Zod's tyranny. Okay, I won't bore you any more of the, of the plot details, only to say that as the planet is destroyed, uh, the baby Superman does indeed escape, and General Zod manages to survive as well. And then the movie will unfold as the story of the battle between these two figures, General Zod and Superman. Representative of state-controlled, you know, manipulation and personal autonomy, let's say. Now, if you think that Plato um, reference is a little bit uh, too recherche or I'm reading too much into the movie, at one point, the teenage Superman, he's being beaten up by his friends because his dad told him, look, don't reveal your superpowers yet. So he's being beaten up by his friends. And he was reading uh, Plato's Republic. So they're making explicit uh, Plato reference. Well, you know what comes to mind here is the work of Karl Popper. Karl Popper was a uh, 20th century philosopher who grew up uh, under Hitler. So he knew all about totalitarianism. And he rails against it for the rest of his life. And he writes a famous book called The Open Society and Its Enemies, in which he identifies Plato, the great Plato, as the father of all totalitarianism. And what he means is this, that Plato, like all totalitarians, begins with some kind of idealistic uh, notion. So in Plato's case, you know, here's the perfect republic. Here's the way things ought to be organized. But then what he does is he strictly requires that that society come into being through uh, legal uh, prescription. So, you know, in, in Plato, there's a strict communism of the guardians. They have to have all property and wives and children in common. Among the um, auxiliaries, who are the soldiers, there's a very strict censorship in place because their emotions and bodies have to be shaped in a particular way. They can't listen to any old song or read any old uh, myth. So there's strict censorship, absolutely enforced communism, etc. So Karl Popper sees this as the prototype of all forms of state-controlled totalitarianism. He sees, in fact, you know, uh, Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Russia, uh, Mao's China, and he probably would have seen uh, the Ayatollah's Iran as direct descendants of Plato's uh, Republic. It's a curious thing, by the way that the Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of the modern Iranian theocratic state, was indeed a great devotee of Plato. In fact, taught Plato as a young man. So that would kind of confirm Karl Popper's uh, theory. Okay, there's, if you want, the totalitarian society, the enemy of what Popper calls the open society. So he becomes now an advocate of the great sort of liberal democracies of modernity. They put a stress not on you know, state control of everything, but on individual freedom. Uh, he certainly would approve of Thomas Jefferson, who would say, you know, we have these basic human rights, the government ought not to get in the way of those, and that we should pursue freedom as we see fit. 
uh, the autonomous self in the midst of an open and free society, that's the political ideal. Now, here's the thing. If, if Plato is the uh, prototype, he's the philosopher of the totalitarian society, at the limit, Nietzsche is the philosopher of the um, open society. And here's what I mean. Um, if you say, well, individual liberty is the great value, individual autonomy. The limit case of that would be Nietzsche's Übermensch, he's German, Superman, by the way, right? Nietzsche's Superman, who lies beyond good and evil, whose freedom is so absolute that he determines utterly the meaning and purpose of his life. Now, as I've often argued, people like Jean-Paul Sartre are Nietzschean in spirit in the measure that they so apotheosize freedom that they say, well, my individual will determines meaning. And to be fair, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, 1992 decision of the United States Supreme Court that said it belongs to the very nature of liberty to determine the meaning of one's own life, of nature, and of the universe. See, what that is, is the apotheosizing of the autonomous self in such a way that it becomes Ubermensch, it becomes Superman. So here's what I'm seeing in this movie, is you've got General Zod, how like God, representing the deification of the totalitarian state versus Ubermensch, versus the Nietzschean Superman who represents the apotheosizing of the individual autonomous ego. And what's the battle? Boom, boom, boom. These two forces fighting. Might you read the political history of the last, let's say, 300 years as largely a battle between these two visions of society? And I just have in my mind, again, that whiz bang stuff that I hate, but General Zod and Superman, they're just like going back and forth and they're, they're being pushed through buildings and windows. There is the political struggle between General Zod and Ubermensch that's been going on for the past 300 years. Now, here's the thing. The Bible represents a kind of plague on both your houses approach. Because the Bible knows that neither the uh, totalitarian state nor the individual autonomous ego is God. The Bible knows there's only one God, the Creator God. And it therefore places under judgment both the state and the individual. Now, if you want the text on this, I'd recommend Genesis 3, the story of the fall. It shows how individuals and their rampant freedom cause all kinds of trouble. I'd mention the Tower of Babel. You want to see a beautiful reflection on totalitarianism. There it is. Also, I'd look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, which is that great attack on kings. You want kings? I'll show you exactly what kings will do to you. There's General Zod. There's the all-controlling state. The Bible is very clear. It's neither autonomy nor um, totalitarianism. But rather, if I can borrow a term from Paul Tillich here, Rather, theonomy. Not the heteronomy of the totalitarian state where this great other is just, you know, imposing itself on me. Nor autonomy, where my will is absolutized. But rather theonomy, where God becomes the nomos, the law of my life. God, who is closer to me than I am to myself. So in surrendering to God, I'm not surrendering to, to an autonomous other. I'm surrendering to what is actually deepest and truest in myself. The theonomous conception of life that says a plague on both heteronomy and autonomy is a way beyond the battle between Superman, Ubermensch, and General Zod. Okay, I'm sure you'll forgive me for revealing the completely unsurprising ending of the movie that Superman ends up defeating General Zod. See, here's the thing, though. I'd be kind of okay with that that Superman is not going to, you know, bend the knee to General Zod. I am in favor of that. I don't like, you know, totalitarian states. But then Superman, after having dealt with General Zod, he does need to bend the knee to God. 